Thank you, Kevin and Caroline. We continue together on the first page of our bulletin. Blessed be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We will now have readings from several of our parishioners, starting with Stacy, reading from the prophet Isaiah. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we, we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with a firm infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured himself to death, out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The response is from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you, were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Who has believed what we heard? Sorry. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried like a potsherd. My tongue steps to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, Neither does he hide his face from him, them, but when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the end the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deed that he has done. Sorry, Jane, we don't have you unmuted yet. Thank you. Is that okay now? There you go. Thank you. Okay. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Hebrews. Since then, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, 
Jesus, there's something wrong here. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is enabled to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing what was to happen to him, came forward and asked, whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and his another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing around and it was warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer your high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him and bound 
to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And in that moment, the cock crowed. They arrived, then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out with them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to, to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he wanted to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell, me, tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barbarus. Now Barbarus was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And his soldiers wore, wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and purple robes. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police sought him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he is claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stove pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to a place which is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him 
with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it but cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothes they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross, Jesus, uh, the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So he put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe his testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. Again and again, another passage of scripture says they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was the disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in that garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day of Jewish preparation, the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus there. The Gospel of our Lord. It is hard to sit in the wake of that story and know quite what to say. There are probably about 10 different sermons on my mind. A million and one things I want to sit and dissect with you all to teach, to engage. And I want to also allow us to sit in the wake of that story of the gruesome violence of the death of Christ. 
to feel that separation and that absence. Every year, I think the violence strikes me more and more. This is such an incredibly violent day. The death of Jesus is violent. The death of the men on either side of him is violent. The breaking of legs, the piercing of side, and yet is balanced by this tenderness of the care for the body, for the way in which it is prepared for burial. I struggle with this text because it says so much that needs to be unpacked theologically something we have very little time to do, something that cannot be done in one day or even one class, but that takes weeks and months and years for us to come to know in our hearts, to unlearn things we have heard and to hear them in a new light. It raises questions about who exactly are the Jews that are named so frequently and so detrimentally in this gospel. It brings into question why such a violent death needed to happen and how that has any bearing on our salvation. We know that it does, but why? Why is there so much violence? On a day in which we hear the story of the violence towards Christ, we must not forget the violence that this day and this week brings to others. In our Christian tradition, this has been historically an incredibly violent and dangerous day for the Jewish people. And perhaps if you heard the number of times the Jews are blamed for the death of Jesus in that gospel, you might not be surprised. Even this week, synagogues were tagged with derogatory words, including language saying, gas them all during this, their most holy of weeks as well. The way in which we have translated and talked about the scripture has brought violence. The way in which we have tried to understand the violence of Christ's death in terms of our salvation has perpetuated violence. And I'm so desperate for the cycle of violence to be ended. Certainly we could do a long lesson in Greek to talk about the various ways this term, the Jews, could be translated, to talk about the Judeans, actually, rather than the cultural, religious people of the Jews, but how to do that without erasing the Jewish identity, to talk about the complexity of the Jewish identity at this time. That yes, some Jews would have been against Christ while others prepared him for burial. Something we cannot paint with one brush. That is the political power, the emperor, and ultimately Pilate, who truly crucifies Christ. Violence upon violence upon violence, and to what end? I found myself this year in conversations with many of you. As we discuss, discuss salvation, we discussed this very topic, why did Jesus need to die? Certainly, we talked about fulfillment of scriptures. In some way, shape, or form, many of us have been taught that Jesus needed to die because scripture said that, because God required it, because that's what we've been taught. We have spent so much time in our history trying to make sense of violence. We have spent so much time in our Christian history trying to explain and normalize this horrific act. I deeply believe in a God that is a God of love, a God of love who has been a God of love from the time of the very beginning of creation, from the creation of heaven and earth, from the forming of Adam and Eve, walking with the people in the Exodus, accompanying Ruth as she came to be a Jew, walking with all the prophets, I believe in a God of love, as deeply as I believe that God, same God of love is who we worship 
and praise. And so to understand our salvation as needing to come through some act of violence to atone for our sins has never resonated. The God that I pray to is not a God that requires violence, has never required violence. But I do recognize within our history that humanity has so often required violence, that Christianity has so often required violence as the means to the end that we need. Yes, we are saved because of the death of Jesus, not because God required that violence, but because we did. And we are saved not because of it, but in spite of it. In spite of humanity's cruel act on this day, we are loved beyond measure. Despite the actions that we take when we condemn God to death, we are loved and forgiven. That is the God that I know. The God that stands with those who tenderly wrap the body in spices and linens. The God that sits with us as we weep. Who calls us back and holds our hand as we face these violent histories. And helps us know that we can do better. That we do not need violence for our faith to survive. We do not need violence for our salvation. But in the aftermath of all of it, in the aftermath of destruction and despair, God will remain with us to help us build the kingdom of God from whatever we can find and whatever is left. For as we will know in a couple days, God is with us. Amen. We continue in our bulletin with the solemn, con the solemn con collects. Traditionally, this would be a series of collects that we would kneel and bow before the cross as we read. I invite you wherever you are, in whatever manner is comfortable to you, to position yourself for prayer, to join with me in these silences and in these words. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him, might, might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and all the people whom they serve, for Greg, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, and for those whose sacred sacraments have been delayed in this time, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, and their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Amen. 
Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace. And guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase, until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick and the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in God's mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow and the strength of all who suffer, let the, cries of, the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them, for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not encountered God, for those who still seek but have not found a relationship with Christ, for those who have lost their faith, for those who are persecutors of the faithful, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others that God will be in their hearts to open them to truth and lead them to faith. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you. May your love be preached with grace to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who are separated from you and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray or been forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those who with, whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord, and receive the crown of life in the day of the resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and that things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. This time I'm going to invite Fred Milkey to lead us in the anthems, if I can find Fred within our reader list. So I apologize for the delay. I'm going to unmute Fred and turn our camera towards the cross for us to watch while we venerate and pray. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. 
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood hast redeemed us, save us and help us. We humbly beseech thee, o Lord. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. We come back together to pray the Lord's Prayer. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls. Now and in the hour of our death, give mercy and grace to the living 
pardon and rest the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. We end the service in silence. I will keep the image of the cross up for all who wish to remain for a time of prayer. <laughs> 